the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I had an incredible time. Our family had an incredible sabbatical, but I have to confess that having come back after a few months, uh, I was quite nervous about uh, leading worship and preaching for the first time uh, in, um, in several months. And so I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat thinking, what if I forget all the things I'm supposed to say? And um, what if my memory doesn't work like it did before I went on sabbatical? Uh, and then I kept tossing and turning for the rest of the night, which only exacerbated it. So uh, that's why I'm standing here with uh, my thoughts written down a little bit. Um, but uh, it really was uh, an incredible time. And uh, one of the more frivolous things that I did during the sabbatical uh, was I learned uh, how to juggle a soccer ball, which seems like somebody who's played soccer for uh, half his life and most of his childhood would know how to do that. But I never quite understood the purpose of it. Uh, nobody ever juggles in the middle of a soccer game, so why should I spend a whole lot of time learning how to juggle? Um, that may explain why my soccer career could be turned more mediocre than meteoric. Um, but uh, my daughter had been given the task by her coach to learn how to juggle. Their team was challenged to juggle, and I figured since I'm on sabbatical and I could do that with my daughter, we'd learn together how to juggle a soccer ball, um, it would be a good exercise. And, uh, like a lot of things, I got really into it, which uh, made her probably get less into it. Um, but I found as I learned how to juggle that uh, the application was, was much greater. And then as I watched the women uh, win the World Cup, I, I was in awe at how you know, a 40-foot pass from across the field uh, can stop uh, right at their foot. Uh, and realized that that ability, uh, when you learn how to juggle, to, uh, to soften uh, the ball, to be able to kind of absorb the, the power of the ball and then have it just sit right there on your foot, uh, was how they were able to do all these things. And that you, know, you can use your body as much like a glove as you can a bat. I always liked the, the bat part of, of trying to drive it as, as hard as I could. Um, but I started to think the more often that you juggle, the more that your body becomes in sync with the ball uh, and the more that you become one. Uh, as I thought about that, uh, we went on our trip cross country, and as we were traveling, uh, we found ourselves uh, staying with friends, uh, and their son is uh, quite an amazing musician, and uh, if you went into his place, there is every instrument under the sun, and I was talking to him uh, about playing music, and I said, well, what instrument are you playing right now? What are you really passionate about? And he talked about drums. I mean, he talked about how drums are the center of every band, that it's the heartbeat, uh, that it really makes everything else go. And he talked about how much he's been playing drums and uh, it just is incredible passion for drums. And then later in the evening, I was talking to his parents uh, and I come to find out that he actually doesn't get paid to play a drum in any band. Uh, you know, he plays every instrument but the drums, but he realized that he was a better keyboardist or a better guitarist or a better bassist uh, because he understood uh, from the point of view of the drum uh, how to be a cohesive unit, how to draw the whole band together into one. Uh, and so all of that time spent learning an instrument that he doesn't even play professionally uh, enhanced the whole. Uh, I also started to think about uh, seeing Picasso's earlier works. Uh, that are far more uh, realistic. And how much seeing how incredibly gifted he was at realism helped me appreciate where he became as an artist, that uh, the ability to perfectly capture what was right in front of him allowed him uh, to be able to capture not just what he saw, but what he perceived, or what was even beyond that. Uh, but it was that ability, uh, finely crafted ability, to create uh, what was right in front of him that allowed him to go beyond that. Uh, so by this point, you are probably all saying, um, this sabbatical probably uh, didn't really help Ben focus his thoughts. Where is he going with this? Uh, and then the other half were like, he was equally as scattered before he left. It's not really the sabbatical. Uh, but I am drawing this to a point. Jesus coming in the flesh. Jesus coming in that incarnate body to be like us to be one with us, allowed the incredible possibility that God could understand so fully the human experience, that God could understand beyond any uh, ability to observe from afar what it is to be one, what it is to be human, what it is to hurt, uh, to experience joy, the fullness of what it is to be us. And what an incredible gift that God 
practice so fully the experience of being us that God understood this woman's pain so fully, that God understands our story so fully. The beauty of the healing story is not just the power of God to do incredible works, to heal this woman who has been bent over in pain for 18 years, not just the restoration of her health, but the oneing between God and the human condition. Jesus knows what she's been through. Jesus knows what it would feel like to have a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. And I think the ambiguity of her ailment is part of the story. It's part of the depth and power of this story. I've seen so many people who have suffered doubly because they have either not been able to figure out what was wrong, they didn't have a diagnosis, or it was a less understood issue like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome or debilitating migraines or depression or just a malaise they can't seem to get out of or addiction. Uh, and they suffer not only the weight of their infirmity, but they suffer because there's the added pain of not being fully understood, of others thinking to themselves, enough already. Just get up and get over it. Mind over matter. And here is Jesus treating her with the urgency of a trauma unit. Because he knows. He knows what she feels. He has spent his whole life practicing the human condition, becoming one with the human condition, and he knows it has to be almost as healing as the healing itself. He knows. And the story doesn't end with the miracle. There's another part of the story. And I confess that my inclination is to rail against the callousness and hypocrisy of those temple leaders. Uh, it's almost a stock character that's put in there uh, to, 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 to be put up against uh, Jesus in his uh, love and compassion. Uh, but maybe I need to practice what God has done for us and one myself with his story. I need to one myself with them, their fears, their context. What's going through their mind? I've spent a good deal of my time connecting myself with a soccer ball, and maybe my life needs more practicing of binding myself to opposing ideas, to understand their context, understand their fears, to understand the people that hold these opposing views. It doesn't mean I have to come to completely agree with them, but at least I'm asked to practice that human condition step into a greater understanding, a greater empathy, a greater solidarity. For these religious leaders, the only roadmap that they have been given for their faithfulness, for their God-centered life, for the tasks that they were charged with of helping others live faithfully, was adherence to the law. I mean, that was their job, was to teach and help people obey God's law. That's how they bound their lives to God. It's a lot easier for the word, the author of the law, to say in this moment that the care for this woman comes first than it would be for these leaders to lead folks into this whole sea of gray. Where does it end? This woman's ailments are not immediately life-threatening. And once you open up more than just the emergency room of the hospital on the Sabbath, then you've got to open up the pharmacy. And then once the grocery stores realize they're losing uh, market share from the pharmacy being open on Sunday, then the grocery stores are open on Sunday. Then the super stores are open on Sunday. And pretty soon, people have forgotten what the Sabbath is or even what Sabbath time is or even the connection with God and that peace that comes from just stopping. I will say that sabbatical, my sabbatical time has challenged some of my thoughts about Sabbath. The staff and the people of St. James were incredible about not calling me, uh, uh, even to the point where I'd look at my phone and think, well, nobody needs me? It's just, uh, <laughs> they were phenomenal about this set-apart time that I desperately needed. The only work-related phone calls that were coming in uh, uh, periodically were from people looking for food, rental assistance or to pay electrical bills, or to put them up in a hotel. People who didn't have the luxury of waiting a few more months till he got back from sabbatical. And their needs were at odds with my sabbatical time. It felt like an intrusion. But there was an immediacy in their life 
a crisis in their life, and I'm sorry I'm on sabbatical, I can't help you, seemed insufficient. I needed sabbatical, but they needed food. They needed shelter. It's tough, but there's a tension. Yeah. Also, I started to think a little bit about availability. How do you keep Sabbath if you're always on call? I have seen recently how painful it can be when somebody is desperately in need of pastoral care, when they're having that crisis in their life, that life-changing moment, and they reach out for their pastor, and they dial, and they get a voicemail, and the voicemail isn't responded to immediately. And I know how painful that can be. Uh, but I also saw the appreciation my family had of being with me totally of being with me without my cell phone at hand or without distraction, of knowing that they were the only thing that I was thinking of, of feeling prioritized and the difference in my own psyche of really being in a peaceful place of being not on call, but truly off duty. There's a tension there. I'm still siding with Jesus on this one, don't get me wrong, uh, always a safe call, uh, but I have a much better starting place for my understanding of the other, of this person who I originally would have just stocked up as a stock character. What kind of jerk is this guy? This woman needs healing. So I leave today's gospel with two takeaways, a grace and a challenge. First, the grace. Today, we encounter a God who not only heals, but has practiced again and again and again, has practiced humanity to the point of knowing us more deeply than we could possibly imagine, of loving us enough to put that care, that healing, our needs, above anything else, above even God's own words, and the challenge to practice that wanting to start with rereading this text, to rereading this gospel, and put yourself in each person's shoes, in each person's point of view. Read it from the point of view of the woman who can't wait one more day, who's been thirsty for healing for so long. Read it from the point of view of Jesus, who sees his own words, his own law, keeping somebody from realizing the fullness of the life that God dreamed for her. Read it from the eyes of that religious leader who's been given a road map and it's the only road map he knows and trying to figure out how do I lead people into the gray. And then once you've done that, maybe go beyond this story and practice that discipline of wanting yourself with ideas and people who challenge you the most. Maybe he might open up something for you. Amen.